Anyway, we're going to be talking today about Sigmund Freud and his theories of psychoanalysis, also to some extent his theories of culture. Freud has a huge impact on the 20th century. Uh, today, it is not, his views are not held in very high regard. This is really a development in the history of psychology, not in contemporary psychology and an understanding of the various things he talked about. But his cultural influence was gigantic. You, for one thing, cannot make any sense of the films of Woody Allen if you do not know anything about Freudian psychoanalysis. Um, but that's just one indication. Really, from the 1920s all the way up through the 1970s or 1980s, Freud, Freud continued to have a significant impact. In my own introductory psychology course in college, one third of it was dedicated to Freud. Um, that's not going to be true any longer. Freud's theories are really not held in such high regard. But there are a number of different stages of Freud's thought. And it's important to realize that, to get some understanding of what he did. The earliest stage is really the book, The Interpretation of Dreams, which lays out the beginnings of what became Freudian theory. Uh, this is based on his actual experiences as a psychoanalyst dealing with people who had puzzling dreams, who, who came to him with other sorts of problems. He develops that into a full-blown psychoanalytic theory, and we're going to talk some about that today in a whole variety of works that he published during the teens and 20s. And then his thought enters a new stage when he publishes a very short book called Beyond the Pleasure Principle. That's something that changes the theory, as we'll see in a fundamental way, adds a new component to it, and makes it flexible in one way, but from, a, well, perhaps too flexible. It's been alleged capable of explaining anything, and so actually of predicting nothing as a result of the changes he makes in that book. Then he moves into broad cultural commentary and starts talking about the nature of civilization and culture in books like this one, Civilization and Its Discontents. And so there are several different stages of Freud's thought. Really, we can distinguish four stages. The early psychoanalytic stage, the mature psychoanalytic theory, then the theory as it changes with Beyond the Pleasure Principle, and finally, then, the broad sociological, anthropological, civilizational type of theories that dominated some of his last years. Well, let's begin with the interpretation of dreams. And the slide, when it will appear, is really just the beginning of the entire book. He says, wait, yeah. He says, in the pages that follow, I'll bring forward proof that there is a psychological technique which makes it possible to interpret dreams. And that, if that pr procedure is employed, every dream reveals itself as a psychical structure which has a meaning and which can be inserted at an assignable point in the mental activities of waking life. He says, I shall further endeavor to elucidate the processes to which the strangeness and obscurity of dreams are due, and to deduce from those processes the nature of the psychical forces by whose concurrent or mutually opposing action dreams are generated. Now, the question is in part simply, what are dreams? What is going on in dreams? We have our waking life. We have our dream life that occurs when we're asleep. What's the relationship between the two? He's going to advance some theses about that, about what dreams are. But his real game isn't, in a sense, just understanding what dreams are. It's in understanding what the mind is doing in general. So he thinks that focusing on dreams tells us something important about the structure of the mind itself, about the nature of consciousness, about the relationship between consciousness and unconscious processes in the mind. All of that he thinks is specially revealed in dreams. Now let's think for a moment before we get to his theory about what dreams are like. Think about your own dreams. What do you dream about? To the extent that you're aware of it. By the way, everybody dreams. People vary hugely in their memory of their dreams. Some people remember a lot. Some people remember very little. Uh, if you actually try to remember dreams, you will find you get much better at it. I don't necessarily recommend trying to remember dreams. But suppose you think, okay, what are the kinds of things I dream about? What do you dream about? Spiders. Happy times. <laughs> okay, spiders, what you're worried about, happy times, bad times. Balls. Balls? Yeah, and actually it is a very common sort of nightmare. You're being chased and all of a sudden you fall. You, uh, where sometimes it's not even you're being chased or anything, it's just you're in some place and then you slip and fall and you can wake yourself up by that sensation of falling. Other sorts of things that you can think of like in dreams. Love. Love, okay. Um, yeah. Dying. Dying, okay, you dream about dying, about threats, right, about dangers. 
Notice how easy it is to remember nightmares, right, as opposed to other dreams. Often if you're having a pleasant dream and you wake up, you, you forget it very quickly, but a nightmare tends to stay with you a little bit longer. Any other sorts of things that you notice in dreams? Ah, numbers don't work right. Yeah, one of the oldest philosophical puzzles is actually, how do you tell dreams from waking life? What's the difference? In fact, Descartes says, echoing Sextus Empiricus and Zhuangzi and a number of ancient skeptics, how do I know that I'm not dreaming right now? He's writing the meditations, sitting there in front of the fire. And he said, it certainly seems to me that here I am wearing my robe, sitting writing before the fire. But he says, how often have I had a similar impression when I've been asleep and dreaming? <laughs> thinking that I was actually doing this or doing something else, when really I was lying there between the sheets. So, how do you know that you're awake right now? How do you know you're not dreaming at this very moment? Maybe you're not in class, maybe you fell asleep, and you're just dreaming that you're in class. <laughs> how do you know that you're not? Ooh, the time on his clock is changing in certain ways. Okay, well it isn't changing now when he looks at it. But you know, it's predictable. So like, it says it's 110, still says it's 110, still says it's 110. Dreams aren't like that, right? What are dreams like instead? They're sporadic. They're sporadic, right. They seem disconnected. I mean, it's been a long time, but I remember when I was in college taking a, a course on dreams and Freud and so on, I had a dream that I wrote down uh, at the time. And it was sort of like, yeah, okay, here I am in the dream in one place. Then suddenly I'm in a house that feels very, very familiar, although I can't explain what house this is. It doesn't remind me of anybody's house in particular. And yet I had the strong sense in the dream that I knew this house, that I had been there before. Then all of a sudden I feel like I'm driving in northern Pennsylvania looking for my grandfather's cabin, spot where I went as a child. But it's like it's been years since I've been there. Even in, back in college it had been years since I had been there. And so it was like... Yeah, so where was I specifically? Well, nowhere in particular, right? I just had this sense that I was in some remote part of Pennsylvania looking for this old hunting cabin. And then suddenly I'm somewhere else, right? They're disconnected. What are some other features of dreams that make them different from ordinary waking life? You don't know how you got there. Good, you don't know how you got there. You're in some place, and you don't know how, how you got there, or even exactly where you are. Now, waking life is different. Where are you right now? Good, you're in a classroom, right? How did you get here? You walked here. Yeah, nobody says, oh gosh, I don't know where I am. I mean, it feels familiar, but I have no idea what this place is. <laughs> Nor does anybody say, I don't know. I was just here, right? I was in my room, and then suddenly I was eating a burrito, and now suddenly I'm here, and I have no idea how I got here, right? Dreams are like that, but waking life isn't. <laughs> It must be said. Oh, it is. I was thinking, why won't the first sentence appear? What is the deal? Yeah. You really can't control dreams. Yeah, this is like dreams. Yeah. Can't control the same very well either. Um, now that you know. Oh, and now that the, my, it's been so long, my poor iPad fell asleep. Yeah. It, the iPad was dreaming. <laughs> but now we wake it up. Okay. Yeah, this is actually the sentence I read to you at the beginning of this. And we've talked a about a couple of the features that make dreams different. By the way, there's this classic, you know, pinch myself. That's the sort of cartoon way of telling you're not dreaming. I pinch myself. Does that work? Is that effective? As... No. No. You what? Can still feel pain in a dream. Exactly. You can feel pain in a dream. So why, how do I know I'm not dreaming that I'm pinching myself? You know? Right? I don't. And in fact, have you ever had a higher order dream? A dream where you dream that you're asleep and dreaming, and then you dream that you wake up? But really, you're still dreaming? I mean, you're still asleep? I mean, I've had that sense. It's like, oh, I'm in, I'm in the middle of a dream. And then I have the sensation that the alarm rings. And then I wake up and think, whoa, I was having a weird dream. But in fact, I'm still asleep. I'm still dreaming, right? I'm dreaming that I was dreaming and then woke up. <laughs> well, anyway, philosophers have these high order dreams. That shows how brilliant our minds are. Anyhow, um, what Freud is saying is yes, look, there are a variety of things that are different about dreams. And we have to figure out what makes, what's behind that, what unifies dreams of anything. But he says, look, there is a psychological technique that makes it possible to interpret dreams. So first of all, he's not going to just tell you what the essence of dreaming is, what dreams are all about. He's going to say, I'm going to give you a way of interpreting. Now, it isn't obvious that dreams actually ought to have any interpretation at all, right? Suppose you dream that you were walking along and then suddenly you slip and fall and you wake up. What does that mean? I mean, it might not mean anything at all. 
So he's making an assumption here that dreams do have a meaning. It is possible to interpret them. Moreover, if that procedure is employed, every dream reveals itself. So it's not like some dreams will turn out to be important, but others are just nothing. No, no, no. Every dream reveals itself as a psychical structure, <coughs> having a meaning, having an interpretation. Moreover, not only does it have a meaning, it can be inserted into the mental activities of waking life. In other words, it relates to our waking life in a certain way that illumines the nature of waking life. You could think, yeah, the mind does these things during dreams, maybe some of them have meanings, but nevertheless, what does that have to do with my waking life? Well, nothing, or at least nothing interesting, nothing revealing. In fact, according to one contemporary view, a dream is just a, it's what happened. It's a sort of random stuff that happens when the mind is filing what happened during the day. Various things that happen and we're in short-term memory are getting filed in the long-term memory. Other things are getting thrown out. What you're seeing are little things, thoughts, feelings, perceptions, something that has something to do with that filing process, okay? And so it doesn't really have much of a meaning. There's no significance at all. You say, no, no, no. I'm saying it does have a meaning and a significance that relates in an important way to the way that it does. He says, I'm going to elucidate the processes to which the strangeness and obscurity of dreams are due. Notice, dreams often do seem to have some connection to waking life, but on the other hand, they're also strange, right? They're disconnected, they're different. And so a good theory of dreaming will explain why there's some overlap with waking life, why you actually are worried about an exam, for example, and maybe dream you're there taking the exam, you walk in and I mean, tell me, I mean, probably you have student anxiety dreams, right? Where you, all of a sudden you walk in that day, you're not expecting it, it's an exam, then you look down, you're in your underwear or whatever. Um, we professors have versions of those dreams. I occasionally have a dream that the chairman comes running up to me and says, you haven't, you, you're supposed to be teaching such and such this term, and it's November and you've never gone. <laughs> okay, and it's like, and it's always some subject I don't even know. It's like, why are, you know, you're supposed to be teaching 17th century literature, and you've been supposed to be doing it all term, and you haven't been doing it. And so I panic, and I go running into this room thinking, I don't know anything about 17th century literature, what am I, what am I gonna do? And I get there, and the students were all there. And it's like, yeah, they've been coming to class every day since late August, right? It's now November, and they've been sitting there in front of a back room, waiting for me, and finally I show up. And it's like, okay, okay. And then everybody like, okay, we know where we are. You know, it's like, what am I supposed to be talking about? I, you know, what's the cell to say? I don't even... Have that. Anyway, it's that sort of panicky thing. That has something to do with waking life. But on the other end, it's sort of strange and bizarre. And so we've got to explain the strangeness as well as the relationship to all of this. Now, here is an image of Freud's study. That's where he put the patient. He sat in the chair behind. And you as a patient would lie down there with your head on those comfy oriental pillows and you would begin talking. Anyway, he says, when the work of interpretation has been completed, we perceive, and now here is his central thesis about what dreams are. We perceive that a dream is the fulfillment of a wish. Okay, that's what dreams are. They are wish fulfillments. So everything you dream is dreaming that some wish of yours has been granted. Some wish has been fulfilled. That's the essence of dreaming, he thinks. It's wish fulfillment. <coughs> now, yeah, he illustrates this with a little peril. What did Geese dream of? Of maize. <laughs> Apparently, this is a joke in German. It doesn't strike me as funny anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but the idea is what did Geese think about? Well, Goose food, okay, <laughs> maybe. Um, what do mice dream about? Mouse food. What do cats dream about? Cat nip. Maybe right? <laughs> yes. Um, what do people dream about? Well, things that would fulfill wishes of theirs. Okay. So he says dreams are psychical phenomena of complete validity, fulfillments of wishes. They can be inserted into the chain of intelligible waking mental acts. You have these wishes. Some of them are conscious. Some of them are not and those get expressed in dreams, they're constructed by a highly complicated activity of the mind. So, the basic picture is this. There are things you desire. There are wishes that you have. Some of them are conscious and you're aware of them. Others are unconscious. They don't come out in your waking life, but they do come out in dreams. And dreams tell you what some of these subconscious wishes then are. Okay, so there's the Disney-fied version. I hope you catch the illusion. 
A dream is a wish your heart makes. Yes, <laughs> good. Um, so anyway, yeah, that's the Cinderella version. He gives lots of examples of dreams as wish fulfillments. Um, before we get to the objection, maybe I should illustrate this for you. What does Freudian analysis of a dream look like? He gives some analyses <coughs> in the interpretation of dreams, so let's take a look at one of them. In this dream, he's reporting, my friend R was my uncle. I had a great feeling of affection for him. I saw be before me his face somewhat changed. It was as though it had been drawn out leng lengthways. A yellow beard that surrounded it stood out especially clearly. Okay, then followed two other pieces which I'll pass over. Once more thoughtful of that picture. And then he goes on. Now, by the way, Freud does this all the time. He'll be self-reporting. This is one of his own dreams. But he'll say, oh yeah, there was this image. It was very strong. And then, oh yeah, and then some other things I'm not going to tell you about. And then blah, blah, blah. Okay, any Freudian analyst would say, Oh, the interesting parts, Freud, are the parts you're leaving out. What are you leaving out and why? Okay. Uh, clearly you're in <laughs> denial about something. What is it? But anyway, he then says, the interpretation took place as follows. When during the course of the morning the dream came into my head, I laughed aloud and said, that dream's nonsense. But it refused to go away and followed me about all day. Till at last in the evening I began to reproach myself. If one of your patients who was interpreting a dream could find nothing better to say than that it was nonsense, You'd take him up about it and suspect the dream had some disagreeable story at the back of it. Treat yourself the same way. Your opinion that the dream is nonsense only means you have an internal resistance against interpreting it. Don't put yourself off like this. Okay, now this is a common Freudian technique. You say there's nothing to it, he will say, oh, very interesting, you're resisting my analysis, right? <laughs> Suppose the Freudian analyst says, ah, oh, yes, tell me what you're worried about. Well, I'm worried about doing well in my courses this term. Mm. Okay, very interesting. Tell me about, have you ever felt like you were not living up to expectations? Oh yeah, well once I remember, you know, I was in Little League and I struck out a lot. I felt like I let my, let my parents down. Oh, okay. So you're not really exhibiting anxiety about exams, are you? Your anxiety is about pleasing your father. And you think, no, actually it has nothing to do with that. I get along fine with my father. Ah, you're in denial. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so anyway, he then starts doing this to himself. R was my uncle. What could that mean? I never had more than one uncle, Uncle Joseph. And then a footnote. He says, it's astonishing to observe the way in which my memory, my waking narrow was memory, uh, memory, my, sorry, my waking memory was narrowed at this point. Actually, I've known five of my uncles. <laughs> so he's a footnote saying, when I wrote that, I was thinking, I, I only have one uncle. That's fun, nonsense. I have five uncles. Anyway, he says, there was an unhappy story, unhappy story attached to Uncle Joseph. Once, more than 30 years ago, in his eagerness to make money, he allowed himself to be involved in a transaction of a kind that's severely punished by the law. And he was, in fact, punished. My father, whose hair turned gray from grief in a few days, used always to say that Uncle Joseph was not a bad man, but only a simpleton. Those were his words. So if my friend R was my Uncle Joseph, what I was meaning to say was that R was a simpleton. Hardly credible, and most disagreeable. But there was the face. I saw in my dream, with its elongated features and yellow beard. My uncle did have a face like that, elongated and framed in a handsome, fair beard. My friend Barr had originally been extremely dark. When black-haired people begin to turn gray, they pay for their splendor. <laughs> yes, they pay for the splendor of their youth. Hair by hair, their black beards go through an unpleasing change of color. First they turn reddish-brown, then a yellowish-brown, and then only to a definite gray. Barr's beard was at that time passing through this stage. So was my own, I noticed with dissatisfaction. So I saw the dream was at once my friend ours and my uncle's. It was like one of Galton's composite photographs. So I really did mean my friend R was a simpleton like Uncle Joseph. And I continued to struggle and think about this. Ah, yes, and that reminded me that I had had a conversation with Anne, who had been recommended with a profess pro 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 professorship. Here the honor had been paid me and it offered me his congratulations. Um, and he basically said, oh, but, but look, but, you know, this isn't worth your own experience. He said uh, something jokingly, but he, he seems against me. And he talks about blackmail, and then he talks about other professors um, and his feelings about them, and blah, 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 blah. He was not yet quite dealing with it, done dealing with it. Um, well, in short, it all turns out to be about this guilt he felt about something that involved himself and whether or not he really deserved a certain honor. Now, 
That sort of thing involves a stream of associations. So what he does is start thinking about a dream, saying, well, what does that make you think of? What does that remind you of? He pursues these associations one after the other. And finally says, aha, that's what the dream really means. Now, there is an obvious objection to this idea that a dream is a wish fulfillment. In fact, his own dream is to some extent like that. What was the wish there? He's feeling guilty about having earned this honor that he thinks might have gone to somebody else more deservedly. That doesn't sound like a wish, right? Gee, I wish that I didn't deserve this. <laughs> so there are lots of dreams that don't feel like wish fulfillments. Maybe some do. There are some pleasant dreams where it's like, oh, that was nice. But most things aren't like that. What are some reasons for thinking? What are some kinds of dreams that don't seem like wish fulfillments? Yeah. Nightmares, that's the obvious case, right? You have a nightmare. It's like, wait, you want some monster to chase you through a long, dark hallway, and then you get to the end, and you fall down these, these stairs or uh, down a cliff or something. Um, did you want to walk into an exam completely unprepared, unaware that that was the day of the exam? No, right? So there are anxiety dreams, there are nightmares. Any other dreams that occur to you as things that aren't obviously wish fulfillments? Well, what do you mean, false? Uh, as in you fall to your death in a dream? Except oh, falls, yes. Yeah, you fall in the dream. Okay, that, that might be a nightmare, but it might be one of those momentary things. It seemed like things were going fine in the dream. And I don't know if you had that. Sometimes I have that sort of experience. Um, in fact, once, many years ago, I was watching a movie. It was one of those things where I had just gotten HBO. And if you get one of those things, you watch a lot of half movies, you're flipping channels, it's like, oh, that looks interesting, but you don't know what it is. So I started watching this with about a bunch of kids at a summer camp. It seemed like some sort of romance story. It's like, oh, is he going to ask her out or not? Okay. And then suddenly, you know, so the guy's looking for the girl, and where'd she go? And he turns around this corner, and suddenly his head gets split open with an axe. Okay. And I'm like, oh, I didn't know it was that kind of movie. Well, sometimes I have dreams that are like that. It seems like a pleasant enough dream. Everything's going fine. And all of a sudden, you open the door, and it's like, ah, no. Right, so, um, you know, there are dreams like that that are where suddenly something goes wrong. Well, anyway, he offers lots of examples of dreams and wishful moments, but they're nightmares. <laughs> like, here's this wall cap. I mean, your nightmares eat your souls. <laughs> well, yeah, you might have a horrible nightmare about cats or whatever. Um, you can have dreams that fear or anxiety, right? It's not exactly a nightmare. Well, in my house, a lot of my dreams involve cats. <laughs> One of my waking moments in both cats. It's terrible. <laughs> yes. What about chemically induced dreams? Ooh, have you ever had chemically induced dreams? <laughs> Are you on the road? <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, well, I don't just mean the, oh yeah, I got really high and blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, there are medications that people uh, can be on that really give them uh, very strong reactions. Uh, one of my daughters is uh, allergic to penicillin, and when she was on penicillin, one of the things that happened is that she just was crying all the time. When she slept, she had all these just immensely sad dreams. They weren't exactly nightmares. They didn't just involve fear or anxiety, though they did to some extent. They were just unbelievably depressing dreams. And the moment she got off penicillin, it was like not only did her throat clear up and so on, but also she stopped having these awful dreams. Um, so there can be all sorts of different kinds of drugs that influence your dreams in different ways. There are dreams of unpleasant things or events, uh, as we'll see in some of those after World War I that prompt Freud to change the theory. In any case, they don't, those don't seem like wish fulfillments, so what can we do? Here's his response. He says, we've got to draw a distinction between the manifest content of dreams, what seems to be going on in the dream, the surface level, and the latent content of dreams. Okay, so he draws it as two levels of distinction. There's the surface of the dream, but then there's the underlying structure, the underlying content of the dream. And so, yes, it seems to be a nightmare. It seems to be a dream expressing fear or anxiety or some other emotion. But really, it's a wishful fulfillment. <laughs> so the manifest content is often distressing, disturbing, right? Or just irrelevant. It seems to have nothing to do with wishes. But the underlying structure is nevertheless a wishful fulfillment. Now, notice already that this is a sort of sly move, right? Because no matter what this dream seems to be doing, he's going to say there is some level at which it really is in accordance with my theory. And that gives him some room to maneuver. So let's take a look at another dream where he does this. 
Um, yeah. This time it's not his dream, but one of his patient's dreams. In fact, she says, you're always saying to me that a dream is a fulfilled wish. Well, I'll tell you a dream whose subject is the exact opposite. A dream in which one of my wishes is not fulfilled. How do you fit that in with your theory? This was the dream. I wanted to give a supper party, but I had nothing in the, in the house but a little smoked salmon. I thought I would go out and buy something, but remember then it was Sunday afternoon. All the shops would be shut. Next I tried to ring up some caterers, but the telephone was out of order. So I had abandoned my wish to give a supper party. Okay. So that's a simple anxiety dream, right? She's thinking, oh, I'll have some people over. She realizes, oh, I have no food in the house. I'll go shop. Oh, wait, all the shops are closed. Crap. <laughs> that's the content of the dream. Now, what do you think that means? Before we go into a Freudian analysis, what do you think is going on there? How would you analyze that dream? She feels jealous about one of her friends that had a really awesome dinner party. Oh, that, all right, there's one analysis. She feels jealous of some friend who had an awesome dinner party, and she's thinking, I wish I could be popular as that friend. Maybe I'll have people over, too, and it'll be a, uh-oh, yeah, right? I don't have any food in the house. Or <coughs> some anxiety keeps her from doing it. So that might be part of the story. Any other analyses? Yeah. She never actually wanted to hold a dinner party. She wanted an excuse to not have to hold the dinner party. Oh, maybe she didn't want to hold the dinner party. She wanted an excuse for not doing it. And so here's her mind thinking up an excuse for that. I wish I didn't have to do this, and I wish that I had a good excuse. There's an excuse. So that could be an analysis that actually goes along with Freud's theory. So that, that would be wishful if that was her excuse. Right, right. That, that would be wish fulfillment, I guess, because that way she gets out of the, having the party and has an excuse, so gets out of it without guilt, you might say. So yeah, I mean, I don't mean these as unfriendly interpretations from a Freudian point of view. That would fit in nicely to a Freudian theory, right? Here's what he, in fact, does. He says, my patient's husband, an honest and capable wholesale butcher, had remarked to her the day before that he was getting too stout, and therefore intended to start on a course of weight reduction. He proposed to rise early, do physical exercises, keep to a strict diet, and above all, accept no more invitations to supper. Ah, now do you have a different interpretation. Well, he goes on. She laughingly added that her husband, at the place where he regularly lunched, had made the acquaintance of a painter, who had pressed him to be allowed to paint his portrait, as he had never seen such expressive features. Her husband, however, replied in his blunt manner that he was much obliged, but he was sure the painter would prefer uh, uh, a piece of a pretty young girl's behind to the whole of his face. <laughs> Uh, that's a bit lewd. Uh, <laughs> she was very much in love with her husband now and teased him a lot. She had begged him too not to give her any caviar. I asked her what that meant, and she explained she had wished for a long time she could have a caviar, ca caviar sandwich every morning, but it rushed the expense. Her husband would have let her have it uh, if she had asked him, but on the contrary, she had asked him not to give her caviar, so she knew on teasing him about it. This explanation struck me as unconvincing. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And so then it turns out it's really the next day she had visited a woman friend. She felt jealous because her patient's husband was constantly singing her praises. This friend of hers was very skinny and thin, and her husband admires a plumper figure. <laughs> um, blah, 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 blah. That lady wanted to actually grow a little stouter. Um, when are you going to have us over for dinner? You always feed us so well. Okay. And now smoked salmon is a friend's favorite dish, and blah, blah, blah. And so he goes on to say, ah, okay, so now what's going on? It's really this sort of identification with this friend and taking on as her wish, the friend's wish, uh, and blah, blah, blah. I won't go into the full details, but it ends up being very complicated and having this hidden, hidden meaning dependent on all these sorts of background things. Now, in cases like this, he says, where the wish fulfillment is unrecognizable, where it's been disguised, there must have been some inclination to put up a defense against the wish. And owing to this defense, the wish was unable to express itself except in a distorted shape. So what's going on for the woman? Partly she feels jealous of this thin friend. And that friend has a husband who actually wants her to eat more. <laughs> and her own husband is fat and trying to lose weight. And so all of this makes her envious of her friend and kind of displeased with her own husband. Uh, and all of this stuff, and all that gets ex expressed in some odd way in the dream. She wishes she were her friend. She wishes she were in that person's situation instead of her own, and so on. So here's the idea. There is a force that constructs the wish expressed by the dream. One part of the mind is saying, I want this. Maybe I want to be thin, or I want to have a nicer husband, or I want to be rich, or I want this or that other thing, right? And then the other is a sense. 
The other says, oh, no, you can't wish that. Okay? So one forcibly distorts the content of the wish. Really, it's a kind of mechanical, or one could almost say hydraulic picture of the mind. There are these forces bubbling up there, and they want expression. The conscious mind says, or something below the level of the conscious mind, but not very far below, says, wait a minute, wait a minute, no, that's a non-acceptable wish. I can't admit to having that wish. And the wish still has to bubble out somewhere, but it's going to come out in a different form under a distorted disguise. So, that other process allows these thoughts to reach consciousness, but not necessarily in the proper form, right? Will the conscious mind tolerate the thought, gee, I wish I weren't who I was. I wish I were my friend. That's maybe too threatening. And so the sensor part of the mind says, really, you don't want to be who you are? You wish you were your friend? I'm not going to allow that into consciousness. And so it gets distorted and put into a less threatening form. Now, here's one way of understanding these two agencies. The first agency is creative. Dreams express its wishes. Okay, so this is a, a sort of process of wish generation. This is the part of the mind that is saying, yes, I want to be thin. I want to be beautiful. I want people to like me. I want food. I want sex. I want whatever it is I want. Okay? The second agency is playing defense. It's saying certain of those things are acceptable. Maybe the, 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 the first part of the mind says, I want a burrito. And the sensor says, burrito. Yeah, okay, you can have a burrito. I'll let you think the thought, ooh, I'd like a burrito. Um, but what about, I wish I were my friend. That part of the mind says, uh, that is metaphysically impossible. You cannot be other than what you are. <laughs> and so it comes out in some other form. Or maybe you think, I would like to sleep with my friend. And then the mind says, oh, no, no, that's unacceptable. Uh, <laughs> no, um, maybe you would like some maize. How about some nice maize? <laughs> 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 okay? So that second agency please, plays defense. It's basically there. You know, it's, it's, it's playing the net, right? And here comes some wish, and, it, and it's like, wish for a burrito. Okay, burritos are cool. Wish to be somebody else. Unacceptable, no. Wish to sleep with your best friend. No, no. Okay? Um, wish to, you know, actually eat fish. Okay. Wish to be a fish. No. <laughs> okay? Um, wish to have sex with a fish. No, no. <laughs> so this part of the, I mean, I think that's part of the, later Freud really says, look, all these wishes are ultimately sexual. At this earlier stage, he's not thinking that. He's just thinking it's the sexual ones that are maybe the most important to beat down into unconsciousness. And so they're the ones that often generate a lot of defense and a lot of distortion and so on. Now, yeah. Oh, good. How does it go about selecting? This sensor allows some things through and sensors other things, right? And allows certain things through only in distorted forms. How does it do its job? What is it doing? And to what extent does it interact with the conscious mind? Now, in the interpretation of dreams, he doesn't really settle that. He leaves that an open question. In the mature theory, as we'll see, he tries to say something about it. And it really is partly an unconscious process, but does partly relate to conscious feelings and conscious beliefs and so forth. Um, so, so it, yeah, it isn't primarily reason, but it does, he thinks, have some connection with reason, as we'll see. Um, it's more accurate to say that, well, yeah, may, I think that's the right way to put it. The sensor later gets identified, pretty much, with the superego, but the superego is, is kind of a conscious mechanism. This isn't fully. Now, one question that he thinks his theory explains the answer to is, why do we only dream when we're asleep? Why don't we dream during waking? After all, I have all sorts of wishes, right? And maybe, right now, I wish I had a burrito. Well, the mind is okay with that, so as I'm talking, I can also be thinking, I'd love a burrito, <laughs> right? But maybe there are other thoughts that are there in my subconscious that are kept suppressed, and yet in sleep they emerge in a distorted form, right? I don't now start having these feelings. I don't now have the feeling of falling, for example. I don't now have the experience of being chased through the hallways. And so why not? Why does this happen only during sleep? One possible answer would be uh, reason is awake. <laughs> and reason controls the contents of the mind in a fashion that doesn't happen. So one theory would be, look, it's reason really. Reason is active during the day, but it falls asleep at night. And so the irrational can come out and play. 
right? The, uh, <laughs> these dreams only come out at night because otherwise the reason police are there to stop them from doing, having, happening this way. He thinks, yes, whatever that second agent is, whatever the sensor is, his analysis is sleep lowers its resistance. So it's not as simple as saying, look, during the day, the mind is controlled by reason. When reason sleeps, then these other forces come out and play. He really says sleep lowers the resistance. The sensor is there, he thinks, very effectively, very efficiently when we're awake. None of these thoughts come into our mind at all. But when we fall asleep, if the sensor doesn't exactly fall asleep, it gets dulled, okay? It gets, lowers resistance. And wishes emerge in dreams, therefore, that would never emerge in conscious waking life. I see a lot of you staring glumly and looking guilty, because you're probably thinking, oh, what horrible thoughts are going through my subconscious mind right now, right? But the thought is, look, the sensor is highly active right now. Don't worry about it, the sensor won't let them out. Reason won't let them out. But when reason sleeps and the sensor gets a little groggy, that's when they come out. But the sensor is still there enough to allow them out, but in distorted form. So he thinks dreams are a unique window into the unconscious mind. So, here, he says, is the essential nature of consciousness. The admission of something to consciousness is a separate psychic act. Imagine that all these things are bubbling, competing to get into the conscious mind. And only some of them are allowed to. So some get a ticket. OK, you can be part of the conscious mind. You can, you can. But in effect, the mind has a bouncer. Like, lots of people want to get into your conscious mind. But it's a pretty exclusive place. The mind has a bouncer. Big, burly bouncer that says to many of the things trying to get in, no, we don't admit your kind here. Okay? <laughs> and why? Because you are unacceptable, right? Or you are immoral, or you are unreasonable, or you are metaphysically impossible, <laughs> or something like that. This says, no, 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 you can't think that. Well, there is some part of the mind that perceives data arising elsewhere. Um, there is some part of the mind generating these desires, these wishes, um, some part that acts as the bouncer or the sensor, and then some part where actually conscious thinking takes place. Eventually, this turns into his theory in the mature version that there are three parts of the self. Okay, In the interpretation of dreams itself, there are really only two. There is the one that generates the wishes and then the sensor. But in the mature theory, there are three parts. There is the ego. It is the I, the self. The part that relates to the external world decides and acts. The ego is the one that's active primarily right now and during most of your waking life. The ego is the one that is actually conscious, where reason operates, where you're actually doing the thinking and the deciding and perceiving. Then there's the superego. It observes the self and makes judgments. So as you act, there's a part of your mind that's sitting around thinking, hey, way to go, awesome. Or, oh no, that wasn't the way it ends up. Or, oh, what a terrible mistake. I'm going to make you feel guilty about that. Later you will be punished, and so on. Okay, it's your conscience. It is a kind of internalization, he says, of parental authority. So your parents start out being this external authority. You want something, and the parents have to say no. But eventually you internalize that, and by the time you're your age, this is, it's like you're carrying around your own little parent. Okay, the parent who's sitting on your court, on your shoulder and saying, you want to do this. No, don't do that. No, don't do that. Bad, bad, bad. <laughs> okay? The parent is no longer there to slap your hand and stop you from doing it, but the parent in your own mind is there still to say, feel guilty about that. Feel guilty about that. And so on. And then there is the id. Okay? The it. It is alien to the ego. Uh, it's dark. It's inaccessible. It expresses instinctual needs and desires. But it is responsible for energy. It's what motivates us, provides energy to the whole system. And it operates according to the pleasure principle. In other words, I want things. I want, <laughs> give me what I want. Now, this is an old sort of theory. Socrates, in the Republic, expresses this idea that there are three parts to the self. Um, in a lot of Christian thought, there's this kind of sense. Uh, Paul, at one point, talks about his inability to do what he wants to do. The fact that he keeps doing the things he hates. And he really ends up saying, look, I, I'm, a, I'm a stranger to myself. It is not I that sin, but the sin that dwells within me. And it's that sort of thought that's motivating Freud here. Yeah, there's something inside me I don't understand. I'm not really, in a sense, responsible for it. 
It is there inside me. It generates these needs and desires that then my conscious mind has to respond to and I have to decide what to do with. And it feels inaccessible. It feels dark, hidden, foreign to me in some way. Here's, here's a quick little depiction of the theory. There's the superego. There is the id. There is the ego. Okay, um, of Homer Simpson. Or here's another version. The id saying, I want it now. The superego saying, you can't have it. It's not right. And the ego saying, well, uh, I need to do a bit of planning to get it. <laughs> okay, um, which encapsulate, encapsulates in a little cartoon what these three parts are doing. Now, what are the principles involved? The id is operating on the pleasure principle. It wants things, it seeks pleasure. And really, that's the principle, seek pleasure. The ego operates according to the reality principle. The reality principle that says, I've got to adapt myself to the external world. I've got to get to my next class. I need to leave now. <laughs> Okay, and seeks to, in that way, meet the demands of the id to the extent that that's possible. The superego is the one that is conscience, basically morality, saying, no, 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 don't do that, that's wrong. Um, or, you've got to do that, that's the right thing to do. The ego has to meet all three constraints. And so Freud says, look, life is hard. And the reason it's so hard is that the id is saying, want this, want that, want this. The superego is saying, um, you really ought to do this, even if you don't want it. You ought to want that. And this, no, you shouldn't want that at all. And this, no, 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 you mustn't do that to get it. And the ego somehow has to actually adapt itself to the world while meeting the constraints of the superego on the one shoulder and the id on the other. And so it's hard to be Homer Simpson, right? It's hard to actually try to adapt yourself to the demands of the id and the demands of the superego and the world all at the same time. Now, this is the mature theory, but at a certain point it changes. Freud begins to treat various patients who come back from the First World War. And one of the things that was a dramatic consequence to deal with was all sorts of people who had trauma, who had, in this case, not necessarily physical trauma, though they might, but psychological trauma, have post-traumatic stress disorder, um, who have what was at the time called shell shock. Often these people really became withdrawn. It was very difficult for them to interact in any normal way. Um, in many cases, there didn't seem to be anything physically wrong with them. People, nobody knew what to do with this. Now, one thing that Freud discovered in treating these patients is that often they would have dreams about whatever it was that was horrible to happen. Maybe it was something that happened to them. They lost an arm. Maybe it was something that happened to a friend. They were there in the trenches and saw their, heads, their friend's head blown off. Maybe it was some other kind of trauma. But whatever it was, they would have dreams in which they would repeat that experience. Now, that didn't seem to be a wish fulfillment. And yet it seemed bizarre to think, oh, it's because you were talking to your girlfriend and she said, gee, I'm a little too fat, and blah, 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 blah. I mean, it wasn't anything like that. It was like, look, I'll tell you what happened. His friend got killed right in front of him. And so it was easy to see what the relevant experience was. And it was very hard to tell a story about that that indicated that this could, in any sense, be a wish fulfillment. The manifest content, they don't want to experience this again. And the latent content, well, there was no other obvious explanation. They had been through something horrible. That's why they were having this experience. And so where was the wish fulfillment? Now, there's a very serious problem here. And what could Freud say? Well, here's one option. There's something about the normal functioning of dreaming that's been disrupted. Okay? So one answer he could have given was to say, yeah, when you're in some enormously stressful or difficult or traumatic experience, what I've said no longer applies, right? I've said what dreams are, normally speaking, but sometimes in extreme cases, it's different, and they fulfill a different function. That would be a way to go. It's not the way he goes, but it's a possible answer. Another one is to say, well, among the dreamer's wishes are masochistic ones, okay? And that ends up being what he says. Everybody actually has a death wish. They want to go through that again. They want to die. Another answer. A dream is an attempt at the fulfillment of a wish. That's what he says in the new introductory lectures to psychoanalysis. So notice he's not saying it's a wish fulfillment. He says it's an attempt. And so they're trying in some way to get a wish fulfilled, but maybe they're failing. Dreams don't always succeed at expressing wishes. And then, of course, there's another option he never mentioned. Maybe the theory is just false. <laughs> Dreams aren't wish fulfillment. <laughs> but here's what he, in fact, does. He says, yeah, there's a desire to repeat the trauma. Okay? And so, he says, this is a desire for the past. Inorganic precedes organic matter. So really, all organic matter has a death wish. 
The aim of all life is death. Now, can you think of any other explanations besides the ones I mentioned here? Now he wants to save his that? friend. When somebody has this traumatic experience and they relive it in a dream, what are they doing? They want to change it. Ooh, okay. Help. Yeah, several of you have already given, I think, more plausible answers than Freud even contemplates. <laughs> One is that they're trying to process this. What does this mean, right? My best friend is dead. How do I deal with that? Or I've lost my arm. How do I deal with that? So it's one possibility is the mind, it's the mind's attempt to wrap itself around this new reality. It's trying to force itself to face this and say, how do I adapt? How do I change? But the other is it's trying to find a way out. It's like, what can I do differently, right? You're back in the situation. How do I avoid getting my arm blown off? How do I avoid my friend's death? And so maybe it's a problem. It, it didn't get solved in reality. It's the brain's attempt to say, how would I solve it if I were there again? What could I have done? Okay. And so those are possible answers. Instead, he talks about the death wish. Now, in fact, then he goes and applies this to all of civilization. In civilization, it's discontents, totem and taboo, and so on. And so he ends up saying, really, um, yeah, I'll just skip some of this. Civilization is a way of suppressing desires, which is why we all intuitively hate civilization. <laughs> civilization is at war with the id. But, yeah, let me skip guilt and just get to this critique. Yeah, since we have 40 seconds left. Um, Popper contrasts this method with Einstein's. Einstein's theory makes ris risky predictions, but Freud's doesn't. Once you've got a principle like the end of uh, seeking the pleasure, pleasure principle, but another sense of the death wish, there's a sense in which you can explain anything. Oh, you want that? Yes, well, that's of course connected to pleasure in life. You want that? That's connected to death. Now the theory can't actually predict or explain anything. And so he says, really, you've got a theory now that can always give you an answer for everything, but that's not a strength, that's a weakness. This theory is no longer falsifiable. And what that means is that nothing is actually capable of confirming or disconfirming this theory. The theory now actually has no context. It predicts nothing at all. And so Popper ends up saying what he does is take a psychological theory that did actually have some content, and by the time he gets to this point, he turns it into something that has no content at all. For every force, there's an opposing force, so we can bring nothing. Next time, we'll see how this applies in the literature.